Ate, thank you very much. Happy New Year to you all, to everybody here in the boardroom and everyone that's watching us on online. Thank you very much for attending. Can we all stand for um, the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I salute the flag of the state of Mexico, which is the symbol of the friendship among the United States. Can we please get roll call? Priscilla Manuelito. Present. Kevin Mitchell. Here. Lynn Hineman. Here. Sandra Jeff. Joe Manini. Present. Thank you very much. Number two, we have approval of agenda. Uh, Madam President? Yes, Mr. Hiddeman. Uh, on, uh, if I can find the item. I have to look them at here. 7A, uh, school climate survey discussion. Uh, we could table it when we get there, otherwise I'd like to pull that. I have only a partial report, and with the holidays, I wasn't able to get a hold of certain information and certain people, so I'd rather put that off till I can do a solid package of information rather than a partial one. Okay, sir. Just withdraw that. Board members, um, I was also notified that 8B2 would need to be removed from the agenda. 8B2, that's Maya Mira um, going to Mesa, Arizona. Is there a reason why? Mr. Madam President, Mr. Hineman, I this came late and I did not get a chance to ask the purpose or the reason why, um, but I can find that information out for you and, and let you know if it's going to be rescheduled or if it's totally canceled. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering because that's happening this week. I'm sorry, Mr. Manini. With the changes to um, 7A and then the removal of 8B2, um, I motion to approve the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. With, if there's no other discussion, we'll go ahead and ask for roll call. Mr. Manini? Yes. Mr. Heineman? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? Yes. Next we have our public comment. First one we have is Salonsa Jim Martin. Good evening, board members and community members. My name is Salonsa Jim Martin. I am here to speak first as a parent. I am a parent for the, from the community of Tohatchi. And um, I would like to say as a parent that I am um, very thankful to the school, bo school board members for your decision to change leadership of our new superintendent. I believe that your decision has been um, very wise and I think you know from me speaking here um, several years that there have been a lot of issues and concerns that I've had that have not been addressed, um, and particularly um, with changes that were implemented by um, Superintendent Cipetti. So I want to commend you and thank you as school board members for making this change and helping us get the new year started in a good way and in a good direction. I do believe there are a lot of outstanding issues that we as parents who've been speaking up all these years have not um, been addressed by 
um, the former superintendent. And so I do hope that now with our interim acting superintendent, Mr. Hyatt, I do hope we do get our concerns addressed for our community members, our parents, and many of our students out in the rural communities. I know that um, there are a, a lot of issues with um, the buses still that need to be addressed. And if you would look down at my shoes this evening and all the mud I just tracked in into your beautiful um, central office, um, we drive eight miles in muddy roads every day to go to and from our home. Um, and I know that we do get some assistance with the buses, but um, we still have the bridge situation that has not been resolved, and it would really help our children, our students, if they could get bus transportation the way it was before Mr. Cipetti, um took the superintendent role. Secondly, I would like to speak as an Indian Education Committee parent. I am an IEC member. I've been an IEC member for several years prior and got reelected um, recently. I want to commend those who um, administer the Johnson O'Malley program. Again, um, I think it was very wise many years ago for the federal program to come into existence to serve Native American children. As um, an Indian Education Committee member, we do have a lot of responsibility in making sure that Native American children do have access to Native American culture, history, language, and government history. And so we do get training as IEC members. We do go through orientation. We do have resources with the National Johnson O'Malley Organization. And we are um, well aware of what the New Mexico Public Education Department implements for Indian, Indian education in the state of New Mexico. With that, I do again feel that we, continue to, we have continued to be under attack as Indian Education Committee members. And I hope that with the new leadership, this will cease. And I do hope with um, the newspapers, we do get correct information printed about our role as Indian Education Committee members. I also hope that we get um, a lot of the issues that we bring up addressed with um, Indian education. So with that, I would like to again thank you, school board members, for your courageous leadership, and thank you for listening to all 35 schools in the school district. Thank you, Ms. Martin. We'll move on to Bobby Martin. <clears throat> Good evening, board. Um, Senator, I'm superintendent. Let me get this thing fixed here. Um, <laughs> I, unlike my wife, was able to change my shoes before I came in, so I don't have the mud covered shoes that she does. Otherwise, I would have brought them in and shown them to you as well. But um, again, to kind of echo uh, what my wife said, I'd really like to thank the board members who made this decision to help um, further us into progression. Well, with this decision that you made, it's going to help to move things along a lot smoother, and I believe it's going to really help um, for our children's sake. One of the things I'd also like to echo my wife on is the uh, transportation issue. Um, they're still, even though they have some smaller buses coming down the roads now, it's taking care of the older students. My concern, my big concern, is that we still don't have buses that are taking our younger students all the way home. There's a lot of parents, a lot of grandparents, who cannot go drive the two miles to go pick up their kids um, at the first bridge where the buses will not pass. I urge you to please come up with some kind of resolution for this. I, I would hate to see something happen to these little kids if one of them just happens to get dropped off there. Right now, the, the, the current situation is they end up having to go back to the schools if no one's there to pick them up. But that's not to say that something couldn't happen there either if someone's not watching those kids. 
very dangerous situation. So, with, again, I mean, strong priority. Please look at that situation. Um, third thing I want to talk about is um, we haven't had an update as far as the tribal clothing situation. Uh, I'm still very upset that um, we had a board member who was against the idea of the tribal clothing in the schools. Um, when this subject comes up again, I would like to have the minutes from that previous meeting that had the, that board member speak up against the tribal clothing. I would like to have those read into the minutes again so it's updated and documented in the current meetings. <clears throat> I feel that's very important as um, it seems to me that the, there was a big failure with um, the tribal clothing program this year. And I don't know if there's any way that the men's could be making or any way that that could be made up to, especially to the students who really need that kind of assistance. And there's quite a few. Um, as you drive around um, schools itself, you'll see a lot of kids who are without jackets. I don't know if there's any way that the school can make up for that deficit in the jackets. The jackets were a big part of that tribal clothing, and a lot of kids depended on those. Um, as I've driven around the schools, I'm talking about uh, the mid school, the high school, and even the elementary school, I see a lot of kids without jackets. Um, it's not the kids' fault. They shouldn't have to be the ones to suffer for this. <clears throat> um, I kind of forgot my fourth point, but um, so and again, thank you all and commend you all for your wise decision. And um, uh, Mr. Sup um, Interim Superintendent, we really look forward to to um, really getting some better communication and um, working a lot more uh, in a positive relationship to get our school district headed in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. The next one we have is Renee Harding. Good evening, board, interim superintendent, guests, parents, community members, staff. Again, my name is Renee Hardy, and first and foremost, I am excited for the new year, and I do hope, Mr. Hyatt, that you're willing to work with the board and not against, because it seems like all I've seen in the past year is every time there's a negative report brought up, man, we get slammed in the newspaper, or actually the board gets slammed in the newspaper. And I hope this year it's positive. Let's report on students and what they're doing in schools, in their classes, and how they've improved. Um, so enough of the negative, and let's go forward the start of the new year. Um, working as a team, not as one self or let's not be just out here for ourselves. And I wish Miss Sandra Jeff was here because the last article that I read, I was actually pretty upset about it. But it was <coughs> funny because I was on my way to Albuquerque to support my son and my sister sitting on the other side and I said, read this for me. And she started reading, and I said, man, she must be a threat. A threat, but you know what, sis? She's on our team. So let's move forward with that. We've always brought issues up in the past, and it was always, yes, I hear you. I hear you, yeah. I'll let me see what I can do. But it was always put on the back burner. But I really hope this time that action's gonna be, corrective action's gonna be taken or it should be all done in a positive way. Um, let's not just listen, let's make improvements, not just improvements at the central level, let's make improvements at the school level and not just at the school level, let's make it at the student's level. After all, that's why we're all here. That's why I'm here is for my kids, my nieces, my nephews, who all attend the Gallup-McKinley County Schools in the local, whether it's here locally in Gallup or in Navajo. 
So let's just communicate. And thank you again. Thank you, board, for speaking it out. You have my support. Let's move forward. Yeah, thank you very much for your public comment. I just want to first apologize. I'm just getting over a cold. Um, excuse my coughing and um, I'm sorry about that, everybody. We'll go ahead and move to three approval of minutes. Um, the first one we have is on November 21st, 2016. Um, while everybody's kind of reviewing this, I would like to say and, and publicly state that I'm very thankful. Uh, one thing that we're starting to do is a board packet. I, you know, I, we've requested this in the past to have it on the website. Um, I want you guys, the board, want, would like for you guys to see what we see in our board packets. And now if you go to the website, um, you'll see what we see, and that's a lot more of the transparency that we want to offer our parents and community members and staff. And there's nothing, I don't think, to hide in these board packets. There may be some stuff that may be confidential in the future that is pertaining to personnel, attorney, client, those kind of things that we won't, of course, put on the website. But now I'm very thankful. Um, I can't for doing that also putting this on the on the website for all everybody to see what we see um, I did have a couple of questions on the November 1st the one we're looking at there was some things that um, the board requested um, and it stated in the minutes um, some of the things there was a presentation slide I don't know if we're going to still receive that, that the superintendent gave on park scores. Um, on circle, understudy circle A4, it has student um, park score report that stated that a slide presentation will be made available to the board. Um, we haven't received that. Um, the same thing under um, A11 or I'm sorry, A10, legal expenses, the financial report, board asked to have the billings to be sent to all board members. The next one is 11, A11, a presentation it, um, is requested for the, the tribal clothing, um, as mentioned by one of our parents tonight. I don't think we're, we're finished with that presentation, or I don't think a presentation has been given. Uh, I just distributed the addendum. Um, the board asked to have copies of the budget that, um, of the addendums, which um, was provided to us. I did provide that to the board members on A13. I want to stress again, um, and I'm thankful that it is put in the minutes, that the recording that we're doing now during the board meeting um, should start. It says the recording should start when the meeting is called to order and should not be edited. I'm very thankful that that's in our minutes also. Those are the ones that I had. I think we're just lacking that the information that we requested for as board members. Um, so if someone could um, get us that information that we needed, I would really appreciate that. That's all I had on the minutes for November 21st, board members. Madam President. Yes, Mr. Hinneman. Um, first of all, just the detail, edit-wise, edit on 
item under new business item K um, when it says 2016 I think it means 2017 in, in terms of the March meetings that's just we're still in the habit of saying 2016 whether we write probably because I think there's three places that should say 2017 under that item um, and There, I, I just want to say, in the various minutes before us this evening, there are a number of requests and so on, and I think there's two challenges to that. One is it represents work <laughs> for people to provide those things we request. It also takes some alertness on the part of the board to follow up on those, because we say that we, over the last year, I know what comes up, we requested something, we don't always remember to follow up on it and make sure we got it. So things that you mentioned and there are others in the other minutes as well and uh, in this one again there was a presentation on the tribal clothing program report um, presentation requested that this was back in November 21 and so you know those requests were made but I think it does take rereading <coughs> sometimes to remind us you know, what we have Madam President. Mr. Manini. With those comments by you and Mr. Human, I move this minutes be approved as presented with those exceptions. Thank you, Mr. Manini. Roll call, please. Mr. Heneman? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? Yes. December 5th board meeting minutes. Um, Madam President, on this one, um, where we talk about the, <clears throat> the Mayamira trip to Phoenix, I believe we had asked for a, um, we had asked for the donation amount uh, for the, that for that full trip, um, I don't see that anywhere in the minutes where we asked for that. So I, you know, I think we need to add that in there that we did ask. You know, that we, when we discussed the Miami trip, that we did ask for um, the donation amount. Um, and then also, going um, on that same note here. Um, under new business where we had it in the agenda, um, it still states that there was 15 students and two chaperones that attended that trip. Um, but I recall there was a typo and the number was 45 or 40 some. I don't remember the exact number, but we can find that out. Yeah. It was much higher. It was about triple of what was recorded. Yeah, so plus it, it changed from the beginning to plus the, the chaperone. So we need those so numbers to be. Um, sure. And I did talk with our secretary, and she will um, get that <coughs> for us from my Emirate. Thank you. Um, board members, I have a few on mine again on this one. Um, under the approval of consent agenda items, um, I remember our our superintendent, former superintendent, um, he said that the, these, uh, says many other area schools were invited. I think that was an assumption he made. Um, I think he said that's what he, he assumed that other area schools were invited. Um, I think that assume needs to be put in there somewhere. I'm gonna, I, I have questions on the adjustment, uh, the inner tra transfers, but I want to go to the other stuff I have. Um, under study circle A, B, there's a sentence there that says, Super superintendent requested the directives in writing so that all issues will be addressed. Priscilla Manuelito responded to the assistant, our assistants are in attendance and the video recording is significant enough to get the issues answered 
without a written request from the board. That is an untrue statement. I did not make that statement. I said that yes, we would also provide it in writing to him. Um, so I would like that changed. And that was done, I believe. It was done in writing. Yes, and it was provided to him in writing. Um, I, there's no time that I said I would not write it and put it in writing. We did say we would put it in writing. Um, I think in the, the next one, a couple of paragraphs down with the EIE and the Navajo Nation with that monitoring. Um, the last sentence is kind of confusing to me. The question BIE wanted to know how Johnson O'Malley JOM funds were used to benefit Indian education material wise, which was never requested for in the past. Um, I don't think it was material, and I don't know why WISE is in there, but I think what our superintendent said at that time was it was Indian education lesson plans um, that were requested for the first time. They've never requested lesson plans in the past. Um, so I think that one needs to be corrected. The question that I had on the budget part um, was there was some, oh, <coughs> there's some big amounts on here. It says the other contract services, like the third one down and has $300,000. Um, I just want to know what those that one was for. It says general supplies and material. Cur is it curriculum development and services purchase? You know what what were those ones? There were some kind. There were some real big ones. There's that one. Then there's a four hundred thousand. There's another one for fifteen thousand. 45,000, they might, they might be all different for different things, but just the big amount is what kind of caught my eyes on some of those. Sure, the $300,000 one was um, the middle school uh, physics curriculum, which we had originally anticipated as supplies, but it actually became a contracted service. Okay. Um, so it's supplies? No. No, it, it's a contracted service. Oh, okay. And that was the middle school physics curriculum okay. that we implemented earlier. And I'm sorry, which was the other monetary no, it, amount? It's under property, liability insurance, or, and then it says um, provide funds for security services, 400000 Yes, we've, we've had an increase in security services, so I did increase that line item um, versus the prior year. We've had some additional um, evening okay. and additional guards placed at different school sites. I don't know how much that's gonna cost through the end of this year, okay. so I did estimate a little, a little bit as to what that's gonna cost. Um, as you may well know, we've had some vandalism, <coughs> excuse me, in our rural schools. <laughs> And so we've increased the number of security guards and the amount of time that they're on those campuses. And then the um, four down that list, there's a 15,000 for um, funds for sh shredding of confidential materials, 15,000. One of the changes that we made was actually around the uh, office and the different offices, we actually have the shredded services now coming in. That was a change that we made this year. And instead of having staff actually physically shred items, they put them into a locked container and then twice monthly that service comes here and shreds it for us. 
so that increases employee productivity so we don't have someone standing at a shredder shredding documents. Uh, Madam President, yes. I'll be mentioning that. Yeah, I'm aware of that service, various organizations, offices, and so on use it around town. 15,000 does sound like a lot of shredding. And maybe we put out a lot of paper. Right? We put out a ton of confidential documents. And it can be, and, and you're talking about going through and shredding things that have been sitting in storage units. You're talking about, you know, after we've had the years of retention, having them come in and also do those mass shredding instead of having days and days worth of someone standing at a shredder, just having them come and do it. Thank you. Um, the other one is on under student nutrition 2000. I says contracted services, 45,000. Um, as we continue to see a transition between employees for the district and then SFE employees, that's kind of that balance that we're still ongoing. Okay. That we estimated more employees. We've seen more employees transition over to SFE. So that, that needed to change. That, that's going to continue to be ongoing as we have both employees and contracted services. What is this um, grads daycare? So two eight or the two five one five seven. Yes. So at Gallup Central High, we have students that are supported through the Children, Youth, and Family Division. That's a federal funding source based upon the number of students that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, so in that, we were able to increase the number of students. We increased the amount of help that we had. So we realigned some of the funding to associate with that additional FTE. That's all I have, board members. Thank you, Giovanna. Madam President? Yes. With those uh, clarifications uh, stated and requested, I move approval of the minutes before us for December 5th. Thank you, Mr. Hiddeman. Roll call. Mr. Mini? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Manolito? Yes. Thank you. Um, December 19th minutes. Madam President? Yes, Mr. Mini. Mr. Hittiman, sorry. Um, when something is stated in the minutes, doesn't necessarily mean it's a fact. It means it was stated. In other words, what I'm referring to is in the minutes that were approved on November 21st, there's a statement that the overall amount paid to Cuddy Law is $74,768. And this was part of the superintendent's report. I think that information came from the superintendent. I take that to mean that's what he stated. That, that isn't documentation, but that's the amount. It may be correct. But I bring that up because in the minutes now of December 19, uh, maybe this should be clarified uh, in looking at these minutes, it says under item, under old business, that the Cuddy Law has met its threshold from July 1st to, uh, from July 1st, 2016 to now. The district has paid Cuddy Law $300,000. Um, and I think something's amiss there because because we were told the threshold is 60,000. Sure. Were at 300, yeah, and they have met their threshold, um, and that probably was my misstatement, Mr. Hinneman. Um, we are still getting bills in. I just got a bill in recently from August for Cuddy. So that 74,000 that uh, was mentioned by former Superintendent Cipetti is in regards to what had been paid till then, and then we still have some ongoing litigation with Cuddy McCarthy. I would estimate that we would probably be around 300000 this year. So within two months' time, we received over $200,000 worth of billing? No, what I'm issue. estimating for the ongoing litigation that we have with them, because we still have some outstanding cases 
um, that there's still ongoing litigation that's happening. So bills haven't been paid. That 76,000 is just what's been paid and I'm still getting bills from August. But in the minutes, it says the district has paid Cuddy Law and, and 300000 And that's an estimate of what I think we will end up paying them by the time we're done with the final litigation that we have. I believe there's still possibly three outstanding cases with Cuddy McCarthy right now. So it's an estimate of what may yet we, be May yet be, be paid, paid. yeah. Because as I stated, I know that we're not current as of right now with Cuddy McCarthy, and there were um, ongoing discussions with that law firm that, of course, I am not aware of. And if I'm still getting bills from August, that tells me I'm going to get some from September and October as well. And we still have an ongoing litigation with them. When you say litigation with them, you mean that they're representing us? They are yeah. representing us, yes. could sound like we're having... No, no, no. They're representing yeah. us in some various areas, whether it be special education or other uh, human resource related. And again, I'm not necessarily aware of all that's going on there. I just see the bills as they come in. But yes, that should be corrected. Okay, the, go ahead. Oh. I have a list to give. Giovanna, <laughs> um, one question here. When <coughs> If, okay, um, just my understanding here that, you know, that they represent different areas. Mm -hmm. if, if, if litigation comes from the board, did, did we can't separate those litigation, I mean like the litigation amounts, like separate the board's litigation from special ed, or is it just all one? It, it is separate in its billing. So we can identify how much is allocated to whichever litigation is occurring, but as far as how much is paid to that individual vendor under procurement code law, it's, it's whatever is paid, just okay. one amount. On a couple of, I have several things again, once again. The under approval of minutes, um, I just want to make sure that it was stated in, in the minutes that it was corrected that um, included, include in the minutes the discussion on the Phoenix trip, Meyer Mira, and directives of the superintendent. I just want to make sure those were added to the previous meeting minutes. approval of minutes on um, I know that we said we wanted those added on this meeting but were they added in the official meeting minutes is my question it's not on here it's not on the minutes we have but I'm just asking if those were added Can you can you and um, show Miss or tell us where the board directives are? I know I saw it, but I'm not.
Okay, under eight, I'm going. I'm going back to December nineteenth meeting minutes. Under study circle eight, um, it says Frank Trapetti presented the documents detailing the district departments. I I don't know what. Board members, do you remember receiving any? The next paragraph under that, um, I did request for a one pager to help to explain this um, for booster clubs, fundraising, stuff like that for the parents and students, um, but it's not indicated in here. And I would still, again, like to request something, doesn't have to be a one pager, but something to help clarify that. simplify that at our chapter level and to our parents. Um. Madam Chairman? Yes. Um, I recall that uh, our athletic director, uh, Mr. Chavis, presented us with an activity handbook and all that information is in there for the booster clubs. I do not have it with me at the time, but he, I have it at home. Mr. Hyatt. Madam President, I can provide that handbook to the board, and I think also a, a one-pager would be good. Um, as many of the board members know and administrators, we are uh, looking at booster club activities in the district because we have had some problems. It is not something that will be done overnight. It's going to take us some time to draft that and to uh, make sure we think through it uh, as best as we can to make sure that we set the district on a, on a, on a better step forward um, as we make sure that booster clubs are functioning properly in the district. So um, there, are, there are some rules that we follow currently within the handbook, but I also want to let you know that things will be coming forth um, before the new year regarding boosters in the district and fundraising activities. Thank you, Mr. Hyatt. Um, the, other, the other question I have, and I don't feel comfortable with this sentence, is under the one that had the 300,000 um, paragraph, it says the board publicly stated who they want for their for board attorney and at the board, and that the board must vote on its own decision. I don't think we publicly stated who we want, um, so that that sentence bothers me, board members. <clears throat> Madam President? Yes. I, I agree with you on that statement. I don't think, I'm sure that I did not say who I wanted, and I don't think the board did as a board. Uh, we did make some comments in terms of how the, the information that came to us struck us in terms of, uh, since we know that our current attorney 
uh, is one of the presenters frequently at state NIMSPA meetings, and so we know that they have that experience. We did raise some, make some comments and observations about that, but I don't think we took a, made a statement about who we want, uh, because there's a process for doing that. I think we need to, to eliminate that sentence completely. <laughs> I recommend that. Agreed. Yes. I don't, one thing that, one thing that bothers me sometimes, uh, I think just recently is, you know, everything with certain agenda items, it's so condensed and so, um, stated with short sentences and, you know, everything. I don't understand why this one, I mean, it almost goes a whole two, two pages long on one topic when everything else, I, I just, I just, it just feels weird to me that, you know, we can go through the minutes of the first the first meeting minutes and it's only three pages long and this last one is just on one subject is two pages long so <coughs> I'm, I'm just why is this subject so detailed I guess I mean there's it's never like this but yet this section is so detailed on a lot of things um, Madam President, yes. I believe that's the way the the conversation interpreted you as asking for a more detailed information concerning all these that you're mentioning. So I believe it is it's uh, recorded as verbatim and wording, so it makes it lengthy. But it what you and the board requested at the time. Well, if that's the case, I think there's still a lot of stuff missing then. But anyway, there's one thing on here um, that Sandra Je Jeff said too that I would like to bring up. It says Sandra Jeff would like to have the full board interview the attorneys in an open meeting. Um, with that, she was also told that this could not happen due to confidentiality um, of the process and therefore it, she withdrew. She withdrew that, um, that idea. You, what, what section are you on, Mr. Uh, Mitchell? The, um, the fourth paragraph. Thank you. She did, she did ask for that, but was told right after she stated that, that it could not happen due to confidentiality, to, due to the process of the RFP, and therefore she withdrew that. This is this is what I was looking for. I'm sorry. Right after the sentence that we would like to be taken out, it says Priscilla Manuelito. Rec um, Recommends contracting with Cuddly, Cuddy and Law. Jo Giovanna Hanks stated it is not allowable per audit purposes. I, I have never recommended contracting. Um, I was asking a question if, if we could do purchase orders and things like that. I'm, I don't think I specifically, maybe that needs to be um, reviewed again in the video. So you asked, it would be correct to say that you asked about contracting? How contract could be? Because I, I wanted to know, there was a, there was a, I don't, I didn't bring it with me tonight, but there was a section that I read that when I was researching this to where we could do a purchase order for non-contract services, um, up to $60,000. So that was what I was referring to 
um, the purchase order, but I didn't say we. I wanted a purchase order given I to. I mean, those were those were some of the researches that I was doing. <laughs> That's all I have, board members. President, Mr. Hideman, uh, just uh, for what it's worth, comment <laughs> again. You know, the minutes are not a transcript, and I think it's not easy in some of our discussions to pick out what the essential point and how to summarize that. But sometimes uh, it is important that we make these corrections and clarifications because uh, sometimes they do have implications and, and they can be uh, understood or misunderstood and, and used and misused. So I, I think it's worth what we're going through to try to make things as accurate as, as we can, even though it takes some time. Thank you. Madam President. Yes. Um, I agree with Mr. Hideman. I think it's very important that, you know, we go through these and make sure that, you know, um, <coughs> we agree with what's in the minutes. Because a lot of the times uh, these minutes are actually legal documents, so um, we need to make sure that um, we have proper wording of what, what of what was interpreted. So, thank you. So, Mr. Mr. Hideman, you're commented on there a couple of times too. Are you <laughs> comfortable with what? You were said to have said. <laughs> uh, in these particular minutes, I don't remember seeing anything that, that needed correction. Okay. Wishes of the board. Madam President. Mr. Hinneman. Again, I, I move approval of the minutes with the uh, clarifications, additions. I don't know if there were additions. I think, yes, concerning the one page of perhaps mm -hmm. and deletions uh, that were uh, that were presented. I, it, you know, that again leaves them leaves the minutes to be read down. I don't think we have a process for bringing them back after we do that. Usually, but we trust that things will get corrected and reasonable. So I move such approval. Thank you very much. Roll call. Mr. Manini? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? <coughs> yes. Thank you. Moving on to four approval of consent agenda items. 6C, 6D, 6E, 8A, 8B, 8C, 8F, 8G, H, 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 I, H. Oops, there was one that was taken out. Sorry. Oh, no. HJ and HK. The only one that was uh, removed is uh, 8 2, okay. uh, B 2. And that was pulled? Yeah. <coughs> With that being item being pulled and the dropping of the climate. Discussion. I make a motion that the consent agenda items be approved as presented, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Manini. Any questions? If not, I'll ask for roll call. Uh, yes, just as this 
additional comment, I trust that appropriate thank yous are sent somehow to these donors. Yes. I assume that. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Magnolito? Yes. Five study circle A reports. First one is superintendent's report. Madam President, uh, Board of Education, we have uh, no recognition this evening uh, for item 1A. We do have two reports this evening. The first one is the Dene Language Program Report. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation and topic uh, regarding this, and, and there should be. This evening, Vita Slivers will be doing a presentation. It will be by PowerPoint, and so we will turn some lights off and hopefully go into the audience so we can have a, a better view of the screen. But I want to I want to preface this is this is uh, complicated sometimes. Um, it is a big task ahead of us as we continue to try to move forward with improving Indian education in the Gallup McKinley County School District. We are not perfect in this. We have some areas you're going to see in this presentation. Uh, we're going to acknowledge the areas which we have challenges in uh, that we need to do better. Um, there have been several improvements and some things that are happening right now that we're excited about. We do have plans. We do have action plans behind these goals, which you will, we will talk about this evening. Um, and next time, if, if the board would like um, or um, however they would like me to present that or give that to them, we do have living documents that show some of the actions behind, action plans behind these goals. Um, this is a bit of a snapshot um, as to make sure that it's, it's, it's clear and clean for the public to see and understand. But again, there are other documents that we can provide further for more insight in this uh, particular uh, part of education in our district. So I'll turn the time over to the Slivers and um, let her take it away. Good evening, board, um, parents. Um, the Indian Education Report for, for January 3rd, I'm going to go over some of the goals we set for the, begin for the school year. And we've kind of. Um, taking a look at the first semester. So this is just an update for the first semester. Our academic goal for 2016-17 was elementary would increase speaking and listening skills. Okay. Secondary would increase reading and writing skills. The Navajo language coaches work directly with a lot of the teachers on um, Increasing these skills, our goal for the begin for the first semester was to increase the receptive language skills, and that that receptive language assessment was given with the ODLA. Um, a lot the the challenges were some teachers, some of the 520 teachers cannot read and write Navajo, um, and so it's difficult to have them be writing Navajo. Um, having their contents um, objectives in Navajo. Um, the Navajo language coaches provide everything to them written in Navajo. Um, the other thing is that um, they don't focus on the oral language skills. A lot of the times the teachers do not stay in the language the whole class period. They start mixing English and Navajo. The language goals for 2016-2017 were for elementary students to be able to converse in the Diné language. Uh, middle school um, students were to present an oral pro project in the Diné language. High school students were to present a portfolio demonstrating their oral reading and writing, their oral reading and writing skills. And again, challenges. One of the biggest ones is the teachers are not staying in the Diné language while they are teaching the classes. Um, we did not have enough time to support many of the teachers with the Navajo language coaches. We only had three Navajo language coaches the first semester. The culture goals for the school year were elementary students would um, do an oral presentation using their clans, kinship terms, Middle school students would give an oral demonstration of, an, of a cultural artifact. High school would be doing research and present on cultural teachings and its relevance to land, water, community, and or the universe. 
and all of this would be done in the Diné language. Um, one of the challenges is um, some of the Navajo language teachers were not trained on how to research a lot of the topics. And um, we also need to develop rubrics to evaluate all the presentations. Our curriculum integration goals, integration of culturally relevant resources into the K-12 English language arts quarterly assessments. Module two is completed and currently we are working on module three, the sixth grade through 12th grade social studies um, integration is completed. We have um, worked on quarterly assessments based on the net content standards. The challenges are the first semester we only had three Navajo language and culture instructional coaches. We, are pre we presently have five coaches now, and our goal is to be done by June 2017. But um, we also would need some training on building quality assessments. Um, the district had started dual language programs in four of the elementary schools. They were um, Toachi Elementary, Twin Lakes Elementary, Crown Point Elementary, and Navajo Elementary. Um, one of the Navajo language coaches is assigned to these schools to give them support. Um, the, what the challenges, the biggest challenge was the teachers that were hired in these positions were left and so now we have new teachers or we have substitutes in these positions. Only one school, Navajo Elementary, um, has the dual language teacher that started at the beginning of the year. So we are now working with the Navajo Nation, Department of Dine Education, the Head Start program, and New Mexico Dual Language Education to help plan out dual, the dual language program at Navajo Elementary. And our focus is gonna be Navajo Elementary. Um, the, one of the things that's also a challenge is um, evaluating, using the, and, and seeing what kind of requirements the New Mexico PED has on teacher evaluations and seeing how that's going to work with the teachers that are teaching dual language um, classrooms. Elementary schools are, um, the K-2 is focused on language acquisition. Um, three, five curriculum, we've been working on refining that. Currently the K through five curriculum is the same so we've been, um, the coaches have been going back to their pacing guides and um, adjusting the third through fifth grade curriculum for Navajo language. Um, challenges are, this, um, all the elementary schools have different models that they're using for Navajo language. We have pull-out classrooms, we have inclusion classrooms where Navajo language teachers go into the class and work with the whole class. We have dual language classrooms and then we have class, um, classes that use integrating with the core cur curriculum. Um, one of the things that we're also working on is um, finding out which schools need more than one Navajo language teacher. We're also working on um, gathering data to see which is the better model for each school whether a pull-out program works better or an inclusion model works better. We're also um, looking at a lot of professional development for the Navajo language teachers. We're go when we go into classrooms and do our walkthroughs, we can point, um, find some of the training that these teachers are gonna need and sometimes they do come and ask for specific topics. The resources and materials on integrating the net content Standards into the core curriculum is another thing that's been challenging. Um, it's, but it's, we're working on that. We've, wor we've done, um, we're working on the English language arts part of it and social studies is complete. And next year we're gonna do math and science. Um, the 520 evaluation instrument is another goal that we've been working on. Currently there's no evaluation for the teachers that have the 520 licensure. Um, we've got a team to um, work with the Navajo Nation to develop an evaluation tool. 
Um, the challenge is that there's no, there's no model to, in New Mexico for evaluating the 520 teachers. And um, the Navajo Nation currently is changing the criteria for recertification for the Navajo language teachers too. For secondary schools, we're, um, we wanted to start reading and writing Dene language in mid middle schools. We wanted dual credit um, courses for Navajo government, Navajo one and Navajo two for high schools. Um, we wanted to build common assessments, including final exams, so that each school does not do their own <coughs> assessment. The whole district has one assessment that they use for all the classes. Um, the, one of the challenges is um, many of the teachers would need training on building assessments. The 520 evaluation instrument um, is, needs to start, we need to use to start integrating the reading and writing. Um, Navajo lang language teachers, again, do not know how to read and write the Na language. Um, not all of them do read and write the Na language. And that's the update for the first semester of the Net, the Net Language Program. Madam President. Mr. Hedeman. Um, thank you for the report. <coughs> I, I want to say, first, that I appreciate the format of the items in terms of identifying challenges along with the goals that, that starts to make it more concrete uh, in terms of putting our, putting our feet on the ground, I think. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you a series of questions for you or maybe Dr. White, whoever, whichever one of you wants to chime in. Um, on the language goals, I'll just go in order here of your slides. If I may, it's our second page, the 16-17 uh, language goals. Are these uh, aligned, are we aligning those with the Dinette content standards in a pretty specific yes. way? Yes. I don't see yes or no question. You got to yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, one of the questions behind that is whether we're keeping up with the standards because that came out in the professional development session. Dr. White, you did a presentation, remember, for the NLC and teachers a while back, and um, the question of whether we're keeping up with the standards as we go from grade to grade, or whether we get fall behind, and then in second grade we haven't finished the first grade ones yet, or whether you know whether we're really aligning and keeping up with those. Thank, um, Mr. Hanneman, members of the board, um, thank you for your question. As far as keeping up with the, the pacing guide, I believe that's what you're questioning, is that it is, um, we do have some prepared um, teachers who are right on track with the pacing guide, meaning they teach the content that they need to in, in quarters and, and by quarters, but there are several, several of them who do not. So the coaches now, now that we have five, the five coaches identified the, the teachers who need additional support and they're working with them to stay on track so that they can cover those standards by the end of the by the end of the quarter and then thus at the end of the school year. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, going on, I know the topic is meant to be specifically or primarily on the language part, but going on since it's included, the uh, slide on curriculum integration goals and it says quarterly assessments based on the Dennett content standards. I'd like to know how many quarterly assessments have been done. Currently with middle and high school, um, I think we've got one, two, four. Um, for sure we've got the Navajo one, the Navajo two, and the government. Um, it's been, we've been working as we're going along. So the third quarter we're working on right now. So by the end of this year, we should have all four quarters. Um, and in that same s slide, uh, the challenge is it says uh, three NLC coaches, but now five coaches, the goal to be done by June. 
I want to tie that back in when it, the, the first word in that slide uh, is integration of culturally relevant resources. I want to tie that back to the goal of integrating Navajo and Indian studies across the curriculum uh, because that sh that's not intended to be uh, limited at all to the NLC coaches as far as who's doing that. That's meant to be all teachers mm -hmm. attempting to do that. And that's not clear in this slide. It tends to put the burden on the NLC coaches. They're a key resource, but they're not, they can't carry that whole, <laughs> that whole load, I don't think, by virtue of numbers. Uh, so I uh, hope that's, that's clear because um, it's still not clear to me how many teachers in the district are or are not working at the integration uh, goal. If you want to respond to that, you may. Other than one. I'm, I'm not sure how many teachers are doing the integration, but um, we do send out emails to the teachers to let them know that if they need any kind of resource or if they have questions as to which the net content standards their lesson addresses, they, they will email myself or any of the coaches and then we'll point them in the right direction as to what kind of resources they can use or which content standards it addresses. And also, we sometimes, sometimes the coaches will give them different activities they can do also. Madam President, uh, Mr. Hineman, also, I know it's been mentioned before in the board meetings that we do have a new walkthrough tool. I know this is a small piece, but in that walkthrough tool, there is a, a question in there as whether the evaluator or the person doing the walkthrough is actually seeing cultural relevant material being taught or relevance taught in the classroom. And so we, we do have that data, which could give us a, a better indicator. Um, and I would have to look. That's something that I have not seen yet, but that we can look into to see what we actually did accomplish in the first semester. This is our first time, so this is our baseline. Uh, but that is one tool that we have available to us to see how many teachers are using cultural relevant material in the classroom. Now again, that's a snapshot of a classroom during a specific period in time. And so at one minute when they're in there, it may not be um, shown, but 10 minutes after the evaluator or the observer leaves, they might see that cultural relevant material if they were there. So I want to add that. And, and even the visual environment, because there's quite a range in some of our different schools as to what, if you walk in, whether you know what kind of students the school is serving or not in terms of cultural connections. And again, True. that can be beyond Navajo as that majority again, but that, that's that varies quite a bit in, in the buildings and in the classrooms. Right, it's not specifically on Navajo culture, it's all culture, relevant material. So. Dr. White, do you think would you want to comment? Thank you, Mr. Henneman. I just wanted to add to what Ms. Liver said on the modules. The modules is we're focusing on ELA first, so we're integrating mod module two means that semester quarter two we're working on module three, which is third quarter, and then module four will be um, fourth quarter. So by the end of June, we should have all the four quarters done. And what we're doing is taking the um, ELA, English Language Arts Curriculum Guide, pacing guide that we have, and integrating and highlighting and identifying some resources and materials that teachers may use as they are teaching that specific concept or skill. <laughs> to the dual language slide. Um, I didn't realize and wouldn't have except for this report that we only are, that apparently we're only down to, we're down to only one school that's doing the dual language at this point. And I'm wondering even with that school, um, if parents are really understanding the dual language model, and maybe they are, but I, because earlier when this was, when the pilot idea was initiated, my impression was that there was, there was not a clear understanding by parents of what we meant when we said dual, dual language model versus immersion or whatever. So I don't know where that's at in terms of parents. Thank you for the question again on dual language. Initially, we had a lofty goal of um, piloting four schools, and then when we got that rolling, some of the personnel that was involved in those schools um, left or they did something different. So as a result, we ended up with one school at Navajo. Right now, we do we are stepping back a couple of steps, basically, and we're looking at it, building the framework, the base, for informing not only the parents, but the community out at Navajo. 
and we have the New Mexico Dual Language Education Program that's willing to help us so that we can get started this semester laying the foundation, serving the parents, serving the community and others, and also partnering with Head Start because that's the feeder, pro the feeder schools into the kindergarten classes. So we need Navajo Nation's help in that because they're a feeder program into our kindergarten as well as our own. And one of the things that we're coming up against in the, um, um, is the evaluation criteria from New Mexico PED. They are specifically telling us that kindergarten teachers will be evaluated on these things. And so we're looking at how those requirements can fit into a dual language program. So as we're doing that, um, the folks from Navajo, um, New, New Mexico dual language program is helping us follow through with these steps. So we have them to help us uh, restart, and we want to make sure that we have one program rolling very well so that we can um, use that as a model for the following for other schools too. Yeah. Oh. I, um, with you saying that, um, um, Dr. White, as far as um, <coughs> you're trying to find one model, we have um, three different ones going on, I, I believe. We have the, um, the dual language, then we have the pull out, and then we have the immersion. I mean, how, how I don't understand why we're trying to do three different steps and, and when, we, when we can't get one. I mean, we're, we're having a hard time implementing, implementing one of these either dual language, pull out, or immersion. Um, but yet, it seems like at this time we're trying to do all three at the same time, and we can't even seem to get one going correctly. I don't, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, you're right. In the elementaries, we have four focus areas, and we're trying to do all four all at once, and we're not doing a very good job of doing all of them very well. So the dual language is only at Navajo Elementary, one classroom, and immersion is synonymous with dual language. In, rest, in Arizona, they have immersions, but in New Mexico, there's no such thing as immersion. They call it dual language. So therefore, we use the dual language. And like under the elementary um, category that Ms. Livers reported on, we said we're looking at um, identifying what is best for the students at that school. Is it the pull-out model? Is it the inclusion model? So we're gathering data now from not just our teachers, but our students and their parents to see what kind of model they need. And then also asking the principals there if they need an additional teacher. If so, then we will be putting that, we will, we will be given additional teachers to those elementary schools. Some of the schools said we're doing fine with what we're doing. Others said, yes, I need an additional teacher. So we're looking at that, and as we're looking at the budget for next year, we're, we're incorporating that. And through this experience, um, we also learned that we need additional training, not just on the dual language piece, but as far as inclusion and what does that look like, rather than here, you're, you, know, you are now an inclusion teacher. We, need, we step back and we need to identify the training here so that it's gonna be more successful for, for next year. Okay. Um. Um, how many, so how many teachers do we have then at this time? Um, we don't think we've got a number. We have 38 teachers and we have one substitute, one long-term substitute. And also, Mr. Mitchell, is, sorry, I was just going to add, as they've referenced, uh, we plan on increasing that number uh, soon as far as an elementary level. Uh, I'm going to guess around eight. I, I may be not quite accurate on eight to 10, uh, to make sure that we have a better K through five continuum and opportunities for our students. But also I wanted to add that some of our schools are really tight on space. And so what's happening is when we've added teachers, um, in some cases we're almost forced into an inclusion model where we have, may have a, a pullout program where a teacher is teaching in a pullout classroom, but there's not another classroom available due to some of our other issues with capital outlay funding and things in the state. Um, and so we're almost forced that second teacher to work individually with students in um, the regular education classrooms where they're providing the support, um, in some cases almost a dual teaching environment, where the Naval Language and Culture teacher is working with the teacher in the core curriculum. And so that's kind of what's happened in some areas also. So that's why that's 
that's one reason we have um, looked at the inclusion model because we can service more students that way uh, during the day and provide more targeted services. I have a couple. Go ahead. I have two, two remaining okay. questions. Go ahead. Uh, just general ones. One is, are we getting or what kind of help are we getting from the net Department of Education? Uh, a while back, I'm trying to think which meetings uh, where this was stated specifically, but it seemed in the past <laughs> we were not getting real assistance with the agreement we have with uh, with the uh, Navajo Nation to work on some of these things, and they were really not giving us tangible support and help. Uh, support maybe, but not help. I mean, are we getting real assistance from them in the curriculum development area or in the teacher evaluation thing is mentioned on here, but what are we, what are we getting from them? Um, yes, um, OSCAD has been um, collaborating with us with the evaluation portion of developing that tool and also with the integrating of the, the net content standards into the core curriculum. Um, okay, I've gone to my last question and this is um, for both of you and, and for um, Mr. Hyatt as well, possibly now or, or as we work into it. Um, is there anything that would keep us as a district from testing all students or all Navajo students and, sends, and maybe all students from various language backgrounds in their proficiency in their home language. Um, and I say that because if, if I understand correctly right now, if we have students who are not in the Navajo language program, like say in middle school, where it's an elective, and those students do not get tested in Navajo language. And, and you know, about a year ago, we had some information before the board on sort of the scary statistic on how how very small the percentage of kids is Navajo nationwide who are proficient in Navajo language. And it's very, very small. And so how do we know where our students are at and when they get into that bind in middle school if they got to choose between Navajo language and music or you know, some give up one to get the other in terms of electives, how do, how do we know where we're at so we, we know whether we're going up or down, uh, or the students are going up or down? Because it, I guess what I'm getting at, I think if possible, we should have a test, we should be able to test all the students to know where all the students are at and also as a baseline, but I don't know if there's any Thing that would prevent that, prohibit that, uh, if students are not in Navajo language class, uh, whether we, are we free to test, test the whole students? And, and, and again, I think of that with uh, a few of the other language groups who are in the same situation. We really don't know how strong or weak the home language might be other than self-reporting by the parent once in a while in certain Mr. Hedman, to answer your question about is there a way to test all the kids in the Navajo language, um, the test itself would be the ODLA instrument, and that's an oral one-to-one -one setting. So right. each student takes about 10 to 15 minutes for the test to be administered. So if you take 10 to 15 minutes per student times all the Navajo kids we have in the district, we're going to be stuck testing all semester. Or and we did attempt that last year to see what we can do to test all the kids in one school. And that just that one school took about four days. And that was with Navajo Nation coming out to try to help us. And so we backed off on that because Navajo Nation is revising the ODLA. This is the last year we're going to be using that particular assessment. They're going to be using a different assessment. So we're waiting to see what that assessment looks like and to go from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. I Because, you know, in bilingual ed, one of the scary words <laughs> is semilingual. Some people are bilingual, and we say some people are semilingual, meaning they're not fully proficient in any or either language. And I think some of our kids are that, in that situation, and sometimes parents too. So, but what we certainly want is full proficiency, and it's not beyond the average human brain to be fully bilingual proficient in more than one language and certainly that, that's the ideal to me here to, uh, to uh, not just know part of a language but to know it 
fully and no English fully, no Navajo fully, no Filipino, Tagalog fully, if that's their home language, or so on. So thank you very much. I have a couple of questions, ladies. Um, my first one is, what is the feedback from our IEC membership on this? On your, re on your presentation or report? Um, can you clarify what kind of feedback you're wanting from IEC? I, from I guess I'm or? just assuming that you, 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 that IEC, have you guys asked for IEC input? Have you guys done a presentation for IEC? Um, I just wondering if they had, if you guys are working with our IEC parents. I do give reports at the IEC meetings. Um, if I don't give them a, um, an oral report, I give them the um, handwritten report or a report, a paper report with IEC from at the IEC meetings. Okay, so what was their feedback on your presentation? This presentation, have I have not given to them yet. Okay. Um, the other question, I know that when I was talking to some of the um, Navajo language culture teachers at the festival, and um, they, at that time, we, we needed teachers too, and I was asking them the process of getting their, their certification, and that's the 520, right, mm -hmm. that they have. They said, they kept telling me, I mean, I think almost everyone I spoke to said it was a very vigorous, hard um, test that you had to know how to write and read. So I don't understand why our 520L uh, um, Navajo language culture teachers are not, not reading and writing in the Ned language. I have not taken the 520 licensure test, but to my understanding, it's just an oral exam. So you're given a certain amount of time to speak in um, the net language on topics. I don't think, that I, I can't, well, I shouldn't say anything because I haven't taken it, but I, to my understanding, it's just an oral exam. Back to the reading and writing of Navajo. Um, that's coming from Navajo Nation Dodi folks that we work with. They're the ones telling us that right now the criteria is basically what Ms. Liver said, it's an oral assessment. So, um, so now as they are revising their instructor certification, they are, they are putting in reading and writing Navajo as a criteria for the new certification that will be coming out and then for renewal in the future. But the current ones who have that are not under the umbrella yet. But if when they do the renewal, they will, they will be required to read and write Navajo. That was one of the things that they had mentioned to us as we started the 520 process. And so I wonder how many of our um, teachers would be interested in learning Navajo writing, um, reading and writing, if we offered a professional development in that area by another teacher that can read and write Navajo. I know as <coughs> Navajo Nation is revising their criteria for 520 um, certification, they're also putting in professional development opportunities to read and write Navajo with the NET College, I believe is the main one they're focusing on. So they'll have those opportunities built in when they start establishing the criteria. And I, I, I know the NET College was one of those that they said can, they're working with closely, but I'm sure other schools will get involved too and once they realize that the 520s will be, need to read and write Navajo. Madam President, I would also add that it's a, it's a good idea that we also provide that professional opportunity, uh, professional development opportunity in-house. In I'm sure that we have some teachers that are very fluent in that area and they're teachers and so they could help some of the other ones. So I'm sure we could use some of our resources in the district also. Um, I, I think even like a small stipend, I don't know, I'm just throwing ideas out there, but I think um, that would be awesome to have, use the resources we have in our district to better the resources that we have for our uh, best interest of our children. And I, you know, there's different places that I've read that the best way, and I think this was even brought to me by a very intelligent Native woman, 
um, in our district was inclusion is the best way to to gain to help our children um, learn their native languages to where they're infused in it daily and I think that 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 that's true I mean I didn't learn Navajo by going to my grandma's house once a week um, you know I, she we were living with her the whole summer and getting that knowledge so I just wanted to kind of mention that also and I think um, I, I know we're moving in the right direction with this and I thank you ladies for your report and I know it's not an easy area um, but I know that reading trying to integrate a curriculum into reading with the Navajo language is difficult and I think I don't know you know some maybe in other areas of science and social studies um, maybe easier than reading I I'm just throwing ideas out there too because there's a lot of things in our culture that are based with in um, social studies and science areas so um, just an idea well, madam president yes um, you answered Mr. Hideman's question on the, as far as assistance from Navajo Nation. Um, are we getting any assistance from the state since they are requiring this by our district as well? We are working with the New Mexico Dual Language Education Program. Um, that's not directly affiliated with the state, with the PID, but it's a subcategory under that. So they have their organization, they're working, they're looking at piloting using Navajo, Navajo Elementary is one of their schools that they're going to be working with directly. Mm -hmm. And I know they're working with another um, school as far as dual language. They want to pilot two schools within the state. And they have the Kellogg Foundation that's given them money. So they're willing to say, here's some money, how can we help you? So they've asked, they've stepped forward and said, how can we help? Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Mr. Hyatt? Yes, Madam President. Um, I think it's really important that we know um, how, I, there was a question asked and they said, I don't know how many teachers are integrating this into, the, into their classrooms. I think we need to know that number um, because I don't want these ladies and us to do so much work in this integration and revitalizing our language and culture when we have individuals that are just dead set against it and don't want anything or any integration at all. And I would like to know the numbers. Um, I don't know how many teachers we have in our district that, and I think it should be that same number um, ar across the board. Um, so I would like to know that number. What, how many of our teachers are doing this integration um, at any level, if it's just dual credit, if it's, um, inclusion, if it's um, pull out, um, I want to I want to know those numbers. And the other thing is, I you know I, I talk so much about Indian education, and it bothers me that this presentation has not been um, discussed with our Indian education. So I would really like to request of you to that this presentation be given to our IEC um, parents also, and see what their feedback is because they work directly with their schools and I know it's something that they would also monitor for us at different stages. And you know, we're ordering supplies, we're getting things that our teachers need, books, um, you know, they're, they're asking for all these things and I think our IEC is that connection also to help um, bridge that gap and make sure that those supplies are being utilized, sir. Madam President, we will work on getting um, as accurate numbers as we possibly can at this time with the assessments and, op and our principals to get how many teachers are in incorporating this into their um, classrooms. Some of them I know that when it comes out, the data is going to show if somebody incorporates it one time, one day a year, um, that's not enough. And so it's not going to be perfectly accurate how much time is spent. That would be the best ac uh, accurate measure of how we're doing. Uh, with regards to the IEC, we definitely can do a presentation and seek input. Uh, this particular presentation uh, was put together after I um, gave some of my input late um, the last few days. And so we can definitely break this to the IEC and get some more input. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam President? Yes. If I may add to what you just said, uh, 
several times I've mentioned, and I still have, I don't think we've pinned it down yet, and that is how many, how many students are really getting how many minutes of Navajo language instruction, even elementary, where theoretically we're told it's every day. I'm not convinced in all cases that's happening. I, I'd like to know uh, to what extent we're doing that and to what extent we're falling short of that uh, theoretical hour a day or 55 minute hour, whatever the hour may be. Um, and that part, and then also this presentation, uh, I know there's only so many hours in a day <laughs> for all of us, but this to me would be a good presentation to make for parents at schools, not just the IEC, but parents, both as information as an, and as a device to get feedback, like you're saying. They, it's something tangible they can respond to. It doesn't have a real a lot of detail to get lost in, in, a sense, in that sense, but it gives parents something to say, yeah, well, this looks good to us, or whatever, you know. And, and if we could start that, getting out, not to the, only to school advisory committees, but to open open parent presentations, I think this is, would be appropriate. Thank you. Well, Madam President, our next in board, school board, our last presentation for the superintendent's report is on uh, the solar panels. I know there has been some information. We don't have a lot of new information, but I'm going to let Mr. Ron Triplehorn, our Director of Construction and Technology, to give you a, another update on that, the progress of that issue. Good evening, members of the board, President, Mr. Hyatt. Um, so the last time I presented to you about the um, solar panels, we were working with a company called Air New Mexico. They were here with me in that presentation. Uh, we are still working with them as well, but I've also had another company that was referred to us by Gallup Solar. Um, they were one of the bidding companies for the uh, city's solar project. Uh, affordable solar. They've reached out to me to talk about doing solar panels at all of our schools. So I am in very preliminary discussions with them on that. Uh, they're a much larger company, so they have a larger investor pool that they can pull from to fund these panels. Um, Air, or, uh, Air New Mexico works with a small handful of investors. So uh, Affordable Cellular is actually under contract currently with PNM to provide them 20 megawatts of solar power throughout the state. So they're, they're a well-established company. Um, I'm working with the business office to get um, electrical usage for all the other school sites so we can see what the demand or the need for those sites are going to be. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Air New Mexico is, we're still working with them on two projects right now. Um, we're working um, currently on the PPA, which is short for Power Purchase Agreement. Um, they've sent me some drafts. Um, we're tweaking it. I will take it to the business office once I'm happy with it. I'm sure there'll be some tweaking that the business office will, will want to do on that as well. And then once we have a document that we feel is, is valid and beneficial to us, we will bring it to the board for, for approval, of course. Um, we will then again start that process with affordable cellular, or affordable cellular, affordable solar. So, um, and so hopefully, hopefully we'll start a couple projects here relatively soon, maybe early spring, late, late winter. Um, and then with affordable solar, so, sorry, I keep going to say that. Affordable solar, um, we will probably s look at starting construction uh, hopefully over the summertime or maybe late summer. So. Any questions? Do, if we've got two companies, just do they end up competing or supplementing? I mean, it sounds like you've got a limited thing you're working on with Cal with uh, New Mexico Solar, and then what they don't cover would maybe go to affordable solar. Is that the way it 
yeah. plays out? Or? Um, well, they're not competing against each other because we're going to basically run into the same power purchase agreements with them. They're going to be as close to identical as we can get them. You know, obviously we're going to be working with two separate companies, so there might be some minor differences in them. Um, but we were we were so far along with with New Me or with uh, Air New Mexico that spent a lot of time talking and meeting and uh, that we didn't want to just scrap that. Originally, we had we had talked with them about possibly doing one project, uh, maybe two, and it did grow to two projects. Um, and so this affordable solar that reached out to us uh, via Gallup Solar, um, I think is going to be a little quicker to work with. Uh, uh, Air New Mexico is a small company. The, the owner travels out of the country a lot. He goes to Afghanistan, Canada, does a lot of renewable energy type uh, projects in third world areas. Um, so he's, he's hit and miss. I might go a couple months without talking to him, so that's why it's taken so long with, hit, with that company. Uh, affordable Solar, based in Albuquerque. I think I was looking on their website, they have 120 employees. They're a fairly large outfit. I think it'll go a little bit quicker uh, in regard to working with them. Madam President? Yes. Uh, Mr. Triplehorn, question on Gallup High School solar panels that are <coughs> stagnant. Can you give us a little update? Are we going to put in a grant in there to re you buy new motors or anything? <coughs> The company that installed the, or Mr. Manini, Madam President, um, the company that installed those and actually developed that technology is no longer in business. Um, I've had, uh, Air New Mexico has actually gone out there and looked at them. There are no, the problems with, that, with those panels is there's no bearings on the pivot points. They use bushings. So, you know how the sand is around here. It gets into those bushings and it just seizes them up and then the motors fry. So actually what we're going to do um, is we're going to pull those out and that's actually going to be the site for one of our projects with Air New Mexico. Um, we're going to repurpose those possibly somewhere um, as maybe a fixed solar system that doesn't track the sun as elaborately as that system did. Um, the systems that we'll be tracking or that we'll be installing will be tracking from east to west. The system at Gallup High tracks east, west, up and down. Um, and it was just way too elaborate of a system, had too many moving parts and no bearings. So, <laughs> so no, we probably won't be investing any money in that because we continually invest money in that. Okay, thank you very much for your update. <laughs> Madam, Madam President. Um, with, with that being said, um, this since Air New Mexico and then um, Affordable Solar, since they'll be making such um, big investments in these projects, they will be maintaining and maintenance in them themselves, or how, how do the, the district have to do the maintaining and maintenance? Uh, so that's part of the power purchase agreement. Uh, what we do is we basically go into an agreement with these, these companies who have taken money from their investors um, and they sell us electricity. So it's their solar system, okay? So they will maintain it. If it goes down, they'll be out here to change the motor. If a panel dies, they'll be out here to change the panel. If the groundhogs get into the electrical wiring or the prairie dogs, um, they'll be out here to fix it because if they're not selling us electricity, they're not making any money. So they will maintain it for 20 years. Okay, after 20 years, we have the option to take those over ourselves, um, and we get free electricity, basically, at that point. 20 years from now, we'll cross that bridge. We, there's, there's extended warranties that, or extended service contracts that you can go into where you still purchase power from them, but you bu purchase it at a much reduced rate because they've already recuperated their money, so it's basically covering the maintenance of the system. Thank you. Sir. <coughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, 
Madam President, that is it for the reports from the superintendent. We're down to um, two board reports. Any meetings, convention, conferences, or training? We'll start with Mr. Uh, Menini. I have none at this time. Uh, I did attend a, a high school in Colorado over the in Denver, and I was very impressed on that school. They have adequate standards that wouldn't you wouldn't believe. Auditorium, swimming pools in this one school. And of course, they have uh, uh, 3,000 students in that one school too. So it's uh, un unbelievable. You walk in the front door, and what do you see is a swimming pool. And then the auditorium is to the left, but that's far, far from our imaginations, but maybe the Fed would help us out some way. Uh, I don't see that happening uh, even in Gallup, let alone the community outwards. Because the money is not there. That is all, Madam President. formal board events uh, this time, but I want to mention two things. One is just as we pay attention to things, as some of you heard, there are some things going in the legislature about eliminating the position of Secretary of Education and also proposals to establish a board, a board of education, which might then, or the Secretary position would be under that. And I, I just observed, you know, it, I'm a slow learner sometimes, maybe always, but thinking just recently at all the legislation that was reviewed at the NEMSPA convention that comes from different school boards around the state. And uh, there are things that affect us. We're, we haven't really uh, jumped into that as a board, uh, maybe in the past, things that I wasn't aware of, but in the last year, year plus, there are certain district or certain boards that seem to do 80% of the, you know, the legislative proposals, and uh, so we're not always jumping, you know, putting our feedback and our input into all of these things. But that's a, certainly an item that would be of interest to us. Whether there's a state board of education as a new thing, and then whether they hire the secretary of education under that or the PED and so on. But that's just something. I don't know how that's going to come out, but that, that's something that I think uh, was of interest. The other thing I just want to mention, I did attend the New Year's powwow at Miramara, Miramara High School. Uh, it was a full house. And uh, I think there were two other Bilaganas there. Um, <laughs> and I mention that because when we observe our, our social community, you know, we have we have integration in our society nowadays, but socially, sometimes we still live in separate worlds. And that isn't necessarily bad. I mean, like, one world is good or bad always, but sometimes we're involved in different things. And so our priorities, our interests, uh, you know, come out that way. And, uh, and yet it was a good event. There were 13 drums, and a lot of times we judge powwows by the number of drums more than the number of dancers. And, uh, and so that was, successful enough that they could they ran out of room in the parking lot for cars and somebody had put cones up over this this end of the Miramura, this separate section between here and Miramura High School so they had to take the cones out so people could find more parking room so it was well attended and uh, uh, generally uh, again a good event and uh, if the, all of the singers and dancers and people sitting on the floor would have been in the bleachers it would have been packed Bleachers would have been packed, I think. So, anyway, just mention that. Madam President, I, this time I don't have anything to report. Um, I just would like to say Happy New Year to um, our interim superintendent and administration that are all here, and to everybody that's here in the audience, um, rest of the board members. Um, I'm hoping for a good year. Thank you, and that's all. Thank you, board members. I just want to say thank you. I think we get these um, little updates and stuff. Um, I know one of them we got from Giovanna, 
And then the other one I think we get from um, Mateka, who's our lobbyist of information of what's happening with this, with the PED or here um, within our district. And uh, you know, I make copies of them, I print them out, and I give, try to give them to each board members. Um, so they can review some of the stuff too. I also attended the the Myrmira sobriety New Year's New Year's Eve gourd dancing and powwow, but I came mainly for during the gourd dancing time. And I just want to thank um, Myrmira School and our and our school district itself for hosting such event because with all the people that were there, um, as you heard, the parking lots were full. They're not out there drinking. They're not out there celebrating. Um, these individuals have taken um, a big dedication to themselves to stop drinking and things like that. We, we should be celebrating and letting individuals know that we do support them because they are our parents within the school district. Um, so thank you very much for offering the, the building and the support um, for our parents and individuals from the community. Um, that attended this event. It was very, it was a very wonderful event, and um, I'm thankful, Mr. Hiddeman, that you did a, uh, attend the powwow part of it. Um, and we did, some of our parents are, and attendants were there also. So thank you very much for that. That's all I have for my board report. Moving forward. Mm. Um, notices and communication, January 10th, 2017, spelling bee at 9 a.m., um, Gallup High School. Um, January 17th is our Board of Education meeting, which will be on a Tuesday again. Monday is a holiday on the 16th. Um, February 6th is, our, is another Board of Education meeting. Um, February 7th is um, school board elections. February 9th is Gallup Day at the, at the legislation in Santa Fe. February 22nd through the 25th is our New Mexico School Board Association Board Institute, uh, which is also in Santa Fe. And that is um, our notices and communications. Moving on with the agenda, we go to seven, old business, the old, the Open Meetings Act resolution. I don't know if you guys had time to review that. Um, I, like I said, those were just, um, I gave those handouts to you. Did you, get a copy? you did send me a copy. I did not send it to the rest of the board though. Oh. I assume they already had it, you're just providing me a copy. So I, I gave apologize. them a copy at Say Guy. Okay. Did you guys have a chance to review that? Madam President, I did not have a chance to review that because okay. I was uh, That's okay. running back and forth and with the vacation, I was lucky to be there at all. Okay, I would rather um, the full board um, look at that and give their input on it before we do anything with it. I think it's um, um, something that's really important, but I don't want to, I would rather you guys review it first before we even Discussion. move forward. Madam President, I'd like to recommend that Mr. Hyatt uh, email the, that document that you received so we can go over it before the next board meeting. <laughs> Madam President, school board, I will definitely do that. Thank you so much. We're talking about um, the open meetings resolution. I understand. Okay. Okay, so moving forward then. Okay. Um, to L, which is um, approval to name the Gallup Public Stadium the. Um, Angelo, I just lost my place, I'm sorry. Angelo, Angelo 
the Palo Stadium, effective immediately per uh, board policy F-1400. Madam President, Superintendent, uh, uh, Vice President, uh, Mr. Hyatt, I have committee members here that are with me tonight. I'd like to point them out into the audience if they'd like to come up with me. Uh, first of all, I have his lovely wife, Diane DiPaolo. If you want to rise or come up, I appreciate it. I also sitting beside her is his sister, Mary. Um, Hi, yes. Thank you. My, my name, and, th and then her husband is also here. So, with that, going on to the motion, uh, they might want to speak a little bit first. But in the executive summary, the board policy F-1400 naming facility was changed on November 7th of 2016 at the regular board meeting. The Years of one's death was from 10 years down to two years. In the naming of a facility of sufficient uh, geographic locations, historical events, and so forth. First of all, Mr. Pa DePaulo was a teacher. He was a coach, first at Window Rock High School and at Gallup High School. He was also the track coach at both facilities. He was assistant principal at Gallup High School. He was a principal at Gallup High School. In the district, he was the athletic director for all the schools in, New in McKinley County. At one point, he was assistant superintendent of public education for Gallup McKinley County Schools. He served on the New Mexico Activities Sports Fame Sportsmanship Committee a private task force committee. He was a track official and was a district chairman for the track in this district. He was appointed, to, he was elected into the New Mexico Activities Association Hall of Fame in 2015. At most of all events at the track, you would see Mr. DiPaolo at the starting line pointing a starter's pistol to start the track meet or to, struck, or to start the track race, the 500 mil, uh, 400, mil, uh, 400 meter race, the 100 meter race, and so forth. He was there. He never, I don't think he ever missed a, a track meet there. He was always for, there for the district. He was also there for the elementary school track meets, doing the same position. With that, I'm going to turn the page. His local affiliation for Gallup, he was president of the Gallup Rotary Club. He was president of the local Italian Lodge for Prince Luigi. And he was a member of the Sacred Heart Cathedral. Are there any others? He was, he was on the ceremonial board. And he, speaking of boards, he was at the RMCH board as a representative for the school, for the county, uh, for the committee, community, excuse me, thank you. With that, I'd like to approve the name of the Gallup Public Schools Stadium to be changed to the Angelo DiPaolo Memorial Stadium, effective immediately upon our vote. With that motion, I make a motion. Madam President. Thank you very much for all those 
wonderful accomplishments by this um, young man, and I do remember him when I ran track um, in high school. So I, I, without further ado, board members, I would ask for a roll call for this motion. Madam President. Mr. Hiddeman. I don't mean to complicate this, but I do want to raise a question about the uh, inclusion of the word memorial. I'm not sure what the most common practice is because we commonly name things in honor of someone who has gone before us, and I don't know if that word is appropriate and needed. It, it, I don't mean to make an issue out of it. I just think this is the time to, to clarify that. Well, I thought that over very well, Mr. Uniman. And looking at other stadiums around the state, most of them are named after a person within the memorial of, like Clovis Memorial, uh, I don't recall the name of it, but it's also a memorial. And that's one example I can remember right now. I don't have objection. I, I, I think of examples in my head of buildings that I know named after people and have is always there, and I understand that sometimes it is, so I don't have any special insight on that. I just wanted to make sure that's appropriate. Your vote. Hmm? Your vote. Mr. Hedeman? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Um, I had a brother who, um, who had great memories and cherished um, Mr. DiPaolo. Um, and he, his name was Greg Sandoval, and he attended Winter Rock High School. And so I am voting yes. <laughs> Ms. Manuelito. Yes. I thank you very much for your support in changing the name. At this time, I'm asking Sonia and the Independent to be involved with this financial assistance and getting a plaque or signage. And for that, I am pledging $100 in towards this situation myself to start this fund, because I know that's not in the budget. So with Giovanna making uh, appropriate actions, is that possible? to raise money for the signage or the plaque. Uh, maybe you want to put uh, paint the press box of some sort, but that has to be decided upon the administration. So I have my first $100 deposit at hand. And I would ask, that, again, the independent to help us out and all the other uh, administrators, Ms. Frazier and Molly, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, and also the other newspapers in the local community. If they can get word out to them that we are trying to raise funds for this uh, memorial. Thank you. put in a quick caveat if all of those donations can be sent to the office of the superintendent so that they can be appropriately recorded. I'd just like to say thank you for all the support. <laughs> to Joe. <laughs> Angelo loved this school district and the kids and all the people he worked with and he found
family and I are honored and appreciate this very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was just awesome. Thank you. Um, moving on to M, approval of travel to various locations for teachers outreach and recruitment from February 1st, 2017 to May 1st of 2017. Um, Mr. Hyatt, do you want to kind of elaborate on this one for the board? Madam President, school board. Uh, we have Ron Donker, Sluter, Director of Personnel, and also San Sandra Lee, our Coordinator for Personnel, are here to uh, give a little presentation um, and answer any questions that you may have. As they're coming up, um, uh, I'll let you guys take over. I always want to jump in. <laughs> Good evening, Madam President, uh, Board Members, uh, Mr. Hyatt. Uh, I'm Ron Donker, uh, Sandra Lee. Sandra is um, the main person that's heading up our recruiting, uh, but it's obviously a partnership. We work together in all of this. Uh, so we're here really to answer any questions. I think you have a one-page um, report in front of you that indicates where we were planning on going in some of our, our recruitment attempts, but we're here really to answer any questions that you have. Um, but this is what we're what we're planning and proposing as far as travel uh, for the purpose of recruiting teachers. If I can make a little addition then, I'm going to jump in anyways. <laughs> um, I know I talked to some of you, but we, we look into where in the country there might be excess teachers and opportunities where there's budget shortfalls. Usually where there's budget shortfalls, there's excess teachers. And so you'll notice that some of these recruiting locations are closer to home. Um, that's a Positive, that's a negative sign for some of those states because that means they're having some budget issues. That's positive for us because it's going to save us a little money as we try to attract teachers uh, to the district. Um, also, I think one of the concerns of the board in the past, which this helps in this area, is that when people travel long distances, sometimes it's thought that they may not stay as long if they're not as close to home. And so uh, we're, we're optimistic and excited that we have opportunities closer to home to recruit. And so I'll turn the time over for questions. I, President. Mr. Hinneman. I have just two questions. Um, I think, um, Mr. Hyatt, you mentioned that something recently to me about Arizona closing some of their recruiting uh, fairs or something. I do see ASU and NAU on here. Just wondering, firstly, where that stands. In terms of yeah, so we did receive information that they will be uh, hosting teacher recruitment fairs but so far they have not posted specific dates and we're not even certain if we will be allowed to attend, but because it's so close to home, we wanted to keep an eye on that and attend if possible. Uh, second question, just, just a question. Um, you, you have experience going to these things uh, and I'm wondering if, is it worth considering taking a teacher along with you, I, I don't know, it's just something that goes through my head. Yes, sir, I do have extensive experience recruiting. It was in part of my wheelhouse in a position that I had in the Bay Area. Um, I was a director of academics and evaluation for an educational <coughs> nonprofit. So I went to schools all around the Bay Area to recruit for the summer program. So every summer we recruited approximately 300 college students. Um, a couple hundred high school students um, and volunteers from the local schools in the Bay Area. I do think it is very worthwhile to bring some teachers along, especially if they're connected to the area. So we haven't identified who the teachers or administrators may be. That's something that we would like to do uh, upon approval of this plan. Just to add one caveat that some of these uh, recruitment fairs are in the midst of the testing season, if you will. So that will have some impact as to who we can take. There will be probably be times where we're only taking 
people from central office because of that. It says down here uh, up to three on some of them. Who might I ask who the three personnel might be? We have not yet identified all uh, the names of, of who would be going. We've just identified really numbers. Okay, another question, Madam President, excuse me for interrupting. Uh, I graduated in a teaching degree from Eastern New Mexico University. I do not see this on the list. I don't know if there's anybody um, in the teaching field of the positions, but at that time when I graduated as an industrial arts teacher, we had 15 people graduating in industrial arts at that time. So I know it's a great educational teaching school. So I'd like to maybe put feelers out if that's a, on your docket uh, to help out with that facility. Uh, who knows, we might get some more. I know that they have a, our culinary arts uh, over here, Meyer Mirror, is, uh, has four students that are culinary arts students that are going to attend Eastern for that, not necessarily a teacher, but they might be going for that purpose. But they are in that program over at Meyer Mirror and the Culinary Arts program. I'll, I'll just respond by saying that, uh, yes, yeah, some of the New Mexico fairs are on the radar. We didn't put them down just uh, yet because we wanted to see uh, really how, how this all plays out. Eastern, uh, we have gone to Eastern and we have had a number of good teachers that have come to us through Eastern, so that will continue to be uh, on our radar. Radar. I will say that our New Mexico schools are producing less and less teacher grad, grads uh, or teacher education grads, so it becomes increasingly difficult for us, but clearly that is something that we would be interested in. I know it's hard f uh, with the legislature raising the retirement for teachers now to 30 years upon teaching being retired after 30 years, and that's not gonna be hard. And I could have done it when I was 25, and I did that with 27 years and f at the age of 49. <laughs> so it, it was good, it was good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Darnell Suth and Lee. I, none of my daughters have informed me that they're pregnant, which I, <laughs> I, I missed out the last time because um, one went into emergency cesarean section when I was supposed to go to Haskell. But I would still be interested in attending one of your recruitments. So I don't know which one you have space available, but I would still like to attend the one, I, what, one of them, so. We'd be delighted for that, uh, for board members who might want to come. Uh, it's a real <laughs> eye-opening experience, uh, plus I think you could be a real benefit to it, so. Thank you very much for your report. Madam President, uh, this is an action item. I do move that the oh, letter yes. of public education Sorry. department yes. take uh, progress and approve this uh, item. Well, thank you for your motion, Mr. Manini. You are correct here, I said report. A uh, motion made by Mr. Manini to, uh, for the approval of this travel for outreach and recruitment. Um, roll call, please. Mr. Heineman? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? Yes. Yeah. At this time, we're gonna go into executive session. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I need a motion. Sorry, Ms. Jones. We will be going into executive session for the capital outlay lawsuit update as allowed under attorney. <coughs> client privilege pertaining to threatening or pending litigation, New Mexico ASA 1978-14-2-1. H7 and 14-2-1H2 limited personnel matters 
on board evaluation of superintendent and report on personnel matters by the acting superintendent. Motion, please. Motion to go into executive session. Roll call. Mr. Manini? Yes. Mr. Heneman? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? Yes. 818. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mr. Hinneman to exit out of executive session at 10.24 p.m. Roll call. Mr. Manini? Yes. Myself, yes. Um, Roll call to exit out of executive session, Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Thank you. Board members, I'm going to move back to um, in under oh, and new business um, approval of the PED letter um, that was stated that it was approved in November of 2016. Um, so no action needs to be taken on that. Um, o, approval of acting superintendent contract uh, at this time, board members. Uh, Madam President, at this time we discussed in the executive session about this uh, contract and it is not uh, ready to be in motioned on, so it's going to be tabled. So therefore, I move this table to the next board meeting in January 17th. Thank you, Mr. Manini. Roll call. Apologies to Sonia. Sonia. <laughs> yes. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Myself. Yes. Madam President? Yes, Mr. Manini? I move this meeting be adjourned. Uh, you did not. No. Um, before your motion, Mr. Manini? Yes, ma'am. I would like to just say that we did um, talk about the capital outlay um, lawsuit with our attorney. We did discuss some personnel matters with the acting superintendent. Um, and the evaluation of our former superintendent. There's a motion to adjourn by Mr. Mr. Menini. Roll call, please. Okay. Lynn. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Yes. Myself. Thank you. And adjourned at 10:20. 7 p.m. Lindy, you have to sign the minutes of the previous meetings. Oh, yeah, they're here. Yeah, they're in that red packet. <laughs>